more time. There is relevance in the resurrection. You'll see it up on the screen. The cross is a ladder to heaven. The cross is a ladder to heaven. That's by Thomas Drake's. And he said that, that we have to understand that the cross that we're celebrating today is actually how you get to heaven. There is no other way to get there. And so as we celebrate on this day, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, it begs a question, Sister Mia, it begs this question. It begs the question, why are some denying the reality of the resurrection? Why are some fooling with it? Why would you question the reality of the resurrection? In fact, some argue when people die, they just die. Yeah, if I'm talking about you, if I'm talking about you, just look down. I'm not talking about you. But some people, district missionary, believe when you die, that's it. That's all. Uh huh. In other words, they are borrowing from a Grecian or from the Greeks that thinks that when the body is in the grave, listen, that's where it's supposed to be because it's evil. And when resurrection actually happened, it's resurrection of the soul and of the spirit. But that body, that evil thing is actually staying in the ground. So some people believe when I'm gone, I'm gone. When I'm dead, I'm dead. When it's over, it's over. Therefore, people have something to say about resurrection because here it is. They are trying to cause confusion and doubt. They're trying to cause, what did I say? Confusion and what? Doubt. Doubt. But this is purposeful. This is purposeful. Let me just the front end lower and say it this way, Sister Erica. When you die, there is resurrection of your body. Okay? When you die, there is more than just resurrection of your soul and your spirit because it's already returned to God. But when the dead in Christ shall rise, there is actually resurrection of the body. And people want us to be confused about that. And so what we have to understand, they want to confuse you, Lady Monica, because it's important for us to believe this. If we don't believe this, the resurrection has no value. If we don't believe this, today is just another day. If we don't believe this, listen, you may as well eat, drink, marry, and do whatever you want because today has no significance. And I love our seasoned saints that are in here on this morning. They'll say, listen, I ain't bothered by that foolishness. I know he lives. He lives. I'm by, I ain't bothered by this new wave kind of progressive Christianity that we have been enticed to believe. But new converts, I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about our new converts because, listen, when you got diverging opinions, it causes confusion. It causes confusion. It questions what you actually believe. You get new converts that just came into Christ when the saints don't know what to believe. Listen, they'll go, well, does a body actually be raised or is it just the spirit and just the soul? And that causes confusion. But I want you to know it is by divine. It is by the devil's job to cause confusion. He wants to cause confusion. I know you think that devil don't have no agenda for me. The devil is a lie. He got a good agenda for you. If he can't kill you, if he can't destroy you, one thing he can do is confuse you. And if he can't do nothing else, he can at least drop seeds of doubt. So how do we, brother preacher, I got to get out of here. How do we keep the resurrection relevant? How in this text today, how's Paul going to help us with this? Come on, Pastor Paul. See, he pins this corrective letter to the church of Corinth dealing with his final corrective topic. What do you mean? Apostle Paul and establishing churches have to slap folk hands all the time. You Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Stop doing this. And the final thing that he addresses in 1 Corinthians 15, remember what I said, read the whole thing, read the whole thing, 12 through 34, but I got to give you the, the cliff note version. The final thing that he had to correct was our misunderstanding about the resurrection. He wants to correct that. He wants to correct that. So what we actually read, Sister Rayla, is a corrective letter about the resurrection. So Paul says that we keep the resurrection relevant 
We keep it relevant when we hear it is, number one, take resurrection's history personally. Got to take it, come on, say personally. Say it again, personally. Because if you believe in the resurrection of Christ from the dead, who's seated at the right hand of the Father advocating for me, I want you to know Christ is sitting around advocating for me. Yes, I am a trained attorney. Yes, I'm a good looking attorney too. Yes, 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 he is. Christ is advocating for us every day. They said something stupid, God. Don't get them, God. They went somewhere they had no business going, God. Don't get them. That's what Christ is doing for us right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. But I I want you to know I won't endure the same ordinary outcome as a person who rejects the cross. And so because I believe in the resurrection, I believe he died. I believe he was resurrected. I believe he's sitting on the right hand of the father. I don't have the same outcome as somebody who don't believe in it. Look at somebody say that's personal. You better get some personal conviction today. Because folks trying to confuse you, people trying to tell you it didn't happen, but you got to understand you're going to get their outcome. I want the outcome for me because I believe in the cross. Look at somebody say, you better believe in that cross. You better believe that he died. You better believe he rose. And you better believe he ascended. And you got to believe he seated at the right hand of the Father. I got some Bible on that. 1 Corinthians 15, 13, and 14 says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. We got, that's, that's, that's the problem. That's problematic for me. That's problematic for me because listen, if these few Corinthians were right that thought in, Christ wasn't raised, he wasn't raised. I don't, I don't believe it happened. If they were right about the resurrection, then Jesus is still dead. If Jesus is still worth still, if Christ is not risen, then those who are falling asleep, grandma, grandpa, and everybody that we love, favorite high school teacher, our favorite cousin. Listen, those who are falling asleep in Christ have perished. See, you got to understand the relevance of this resurrection. You got to understand what you mean when you talk about I don't believe in the resurrection. Listen, if Christ is not risen, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, say perish. And if there's no principle to the resurrection, then the dead in Christ are gone. Here it is forever. I'll never see grandma again. I'll never see my loved ones again. You got to understand what you're saying when you start believing as some do. But you got to start paying attention to the season, saying They say, you better leave that foolishness alone because I'm going to see my loved ones again. If I live this life right, I'm going to see you again. And I, I you know, Brother Kawan, I watch folks that talk about, well, you only live once. I say, no, you only live once. I'm living to what? Live again. So worst of all, if Christ is not risen, then it, then this life we have hope in Christ and we are all men pitiful. We don't have a future. We don't have anything. So if there's no principle of the resurrection, then the whole Christian life is a pitiful joke. Look at somebody say, take this personal. I ain't no joke. I ain't got no tonka toys on my chest. This is no joke for me. Because I want to see the saints again. I want to be in heaven with my Christ. Yes, I do. And so you got to understand, if we don't have something beyond this life to look forward to, why hassle with the problems of being a Christian? Some of us dealing with stuff all the time because we are a Christian. Some of us deal with kind of issues all the time. How many of you had to deal with any crisis, anything in our life because we are a Christian? How many of us got to go through, Brother Joe, anything in our life because we're a Christian? I know y'all in high school, but do y'all go through anything because you say you go to church? Because you said you went to church yesterday, you were going through something. Why go through all of that? If we say Christ has have not been born uh, or, or resurrection never took place, don't worry about it. That's it. Thank you. If it never took place, then this whole thing, Brother Joe, is a what? A joke. You got to make this personal. You got to decide that this is more than a joke for me. And so look at Reverend Romans 10 and 9. This is all I got to do. This is all I got to do. Come on, read it with me. Y'all know that, that, that if thou shall what? Confess what? With thy mouth, 
the Lord Jesus and shall but what? That's the key. The devil is after your belief. He's after your faith. He's after your conviction, Sister Mia. And if you think, Sister Mia and Sister Raina and Brother Joe and Brother Brady, you going to go up on a college campus and they're not going to challenge your belief, you better wake up. Look at somebody and say, you better wake up. There's only a few of us can throw our hands in here and say, as soon as we hit the doors of a college campus, the first thing they went after, come on, Sister Johnson, was our what? Faith. So it says, thou, if thou shalt what, confess. That's easy. I believe he rose. Uh-huh. But here's the key part. I got to believe. And thou shalt believe in thy heart that he raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be what? Saved. Only if you confess and believe. Confess, open your big mouth, and do what? You got to believe. He's after our faith today. The devil is after our faith. I know y'all don't like this kind of preaching. You just want me to tell you that it's all good. He's after your faith. Number two, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm all y'all praying with me. So the relevance of the resurrection is important today. I could have just said he died. Didn't he die? But early one Sunday morning, he got up with all power. In his hand. Now I could have preached that. But the problem is this. What does that mean? What does it mean? The resurrection has relevance. It's important number one. Because you need to take the history of it. Personally. This is not a joke. Number two. You have to take it prophetically. The history of the cross. You have to take the resurrection history. Come on, say prophetically. Uh, This is all I'm trying to say, Sister Mia and Sister Raina. You got to ignore novice. You got to ignore people dibbling and dabbling. They just got the Bible. They don't hardly know nothing. They know a little few scriptures. And all of a sudden, it's just I feel. I just, you know, you know, I think it should go like this. Look at somebody. You got to ignore them people. You got to ignore people that are amateurs at handling, I got my Bible, the doctrine of this Bible. Because they will confuse you. Because the Bible makes sense. It makes sense. And the best commentary, Sister Denise, because she went to Bible class and she went to Bible college, she'll tell you the best commentary for the Bible is the Bible. In other words, if somebody show you something, they should be able to prove it. They ought to be able to prove it. So take the resurrection power or the proof of it prophetically. Uh huh. And stay away from people who just don't know how to interpret the Bible. They ain't got no concordance. They ain't got no Bible dictionary. They ain't got no maps. They ain't got no software. They ain't got nothing. But they had a nerd to tell you that the resurrection didn't happen. Got a nerve to tell you, you ain't nowhere in the world that God raised Jesus' body. But the, the disciple said, I saw him, I saw him, I saw him. No, I, I, I was able to stick my hand through his hand. Anyway, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. But you gotta understand, they are trying to confuse you. Can I talk to some of the novice saints in here on the day? Listen, when you are new to the word of God, do your best to study with folk that have been in the way for a while. Study, don't study when people just getting started. Because they, both y'all, I can the blind lead the blind. You got to study with somebody that know the word. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing, my dear sister right here. If it sounds logical, when you talking to people and they start talking about the word, if it sounds logical, here's how you know whether they're right or wrong, Brother Joe. Say, show it to me. What chapter? What book? What verse? That sounds logical. That sounds really good. That God is the universe. You know what I'm saying? You know, we are involved. I'm going to get back to it. That ain't in my notes. That ain't in my notes. I got to get out of here in, in eight minutes. But we are dealing with what's called pantheism. Pantheism. Pantheism says this, that God is the universe. Ain't nothing but progressive Christianity. And panantheism is God is in everything. 
Pantheism means God is the universe. But how in, even my son even know better than that. We were riding going down the Flint the other night, and my son says it this way, and he was 16. He said, Dad, God is not confined to time, space, and matter. In other words, all you got to do to Genesis is go to Genesis and find out that somebody that's not confined to time, space, and matter created the universe. He created the universe. So he's not the universe. He created the universe. He's not the universe. So that's all you got to do. Stay away from folk that just getting started because they'll confuse you. Because it sounds good. You know, I feel like the universe is, is telling me to do that. Baby, show that to me. Where is that in the Bible? That's just your logic. And it sounds good. It really do sound good, but the problem is, show it to me. And when you always act like, what's that state? Show me state. When you always, like a lawyer, show it to the judge. Show it to the jury. Show it to my client. If you stay in that posture, it'll keep you from being confused. Because more often than not, folks that sound logical can't show you. I almost say something. I almost said it. I almost said it. They can't, they can't show you nothing. They don't even know what a book of Jeremiah is. But all of a sudden, you questioning the relevancy of the resurrection. Look at somebody and say, stay away from them. Stay away from them. First, first Corinthians, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. First Corinthians, y'all still praying with me? I see you, Sister Erica, pray with me now. First Corinthians 15 and 20 says it this way. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits who have fallen asleep. I got to deal with that in two minutes. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, what am I saying is this. First fruits is an ancient Greek word, a party. And in the Septuagint, this word is used for the offering of first few fruits in a word that we like to call the entrance fee. Well, let me say it this way. Down payment. Okay, let me say it another way. A post dated check. Put a little bit on it. I'm going to put a little bit on it. <laughs> y'all with me now? It had to come down. You got to teach this thing where y'all <laughs> I ain't got all of it, but can I put something on it? Can I put a little bit on it? Can I put a little bit on it? All right, so this so 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 the first fruits that we see in the text is the entrance fee or the down payment. It's not the whole thing, it's only the beginning of the thing. So the apostle Paul is using this word first fruits. Put it back up one more time to remind us that Jesus is crucified on Good Friday during Passover celebration. Now Jesus has seen at least 32 Passover celebrations. On Good Friday he celebrated on good on on the Passover celebration. But you got to understand because he died at what age? Around 33 and a half. He has seen 32 Passovers. So he knew how this went. He knew how it went. And so Jesus is, is, is crucified on Passover day. And so we are, or at least the celebration. So he is the fulfillment of something we like to call prophecy. And according to the Passover in Exodus 12, Exodus 12, for those that are writing Exodus 12, the Jews marked the doorpost on the, of blood and they took the, uh, the blood of a spotless lamb and they marked it on the doorpost of those. And the deaf angel would do what? Passover. Now, Jesus dies during Passover celebration. Y'all going to get that later. Jesus dies on the Passover celebration. He's a spotted lamb. He is the only one whose blood was strong enough to cover my sin. I don't know about your sin, but my sin was my trifling self. Listen, he was the only one. So he dies during the Passover celebration. Say yes. That's prophecy number one. Number two, and so on the calendar, Sister Nia, I mean, Sister Mia, on the calendar, this is the Greek calendar, the first day of the month is called Nisan. The first day of the month in American calendar, the first day of the month is called what? January. In Hebrew culture, the first day of the month is called Nisan. 
So on the 14th day of Nisan, he is crucified. He is crucified during what time? Passover. Killing. Resurrection. Crucifixion. Y'all with me? Say yes. Then it's believed that on the 16th day down the line, we have what's called the feast of, put it back up, first fruits. Now, what is first fruits? First fruits simply means that you take from the first of the stock or the first of your livestock or the first of the best you have. And it's just a down payment or just a reflection of the whole. It's just a reflection of the whole. So we got prophecy number one. Jesus is killed during the Passover. A lamb, a perfect lamb, an unspotted lamb. Jesus did no wrong when he was here. He, is, he died, so that's prophecy number one. Prophecy number two, he's risen. Because the, the, the celebration of first fruit, it simply means, Lady Monica, this is the time of the year when all your grain grows. This is when you go and collect. This is when you get the best of your harvest. And what happens to our Christ on first fruit? He is risen. But notice what God did because he knew what he was doing. God so orchestrated this thing in such a way that he made sure that Jesus died during the Passover when you were supposed to sacrifice a lamb. And then he prophetically made sure that he rose during first fruits. I don't know if y'all feeling me all right, but I want you to know that resurrection power and that resurrection history is important because he died and he rose and it was told about in the Old Testament. I'm going to say it one more time. He died. He rose, which they talked about in the Old Testament. One, two, three. He died and he rose, but he was talked about in the Old Testament. Look at somebody say, that's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so I want you to note that you keep the resurrection relevant when you're number one, take it personal. Because I ain't no joke. Look at somebody say, I ain't no joke. This is personal to me. But number one, number two, you got to understand that Jesus is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so you got to make sure that you understand, don't let nobody try to take you away from that. Paul says that Jesus is in a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that God gave the best for us. And just some ebony, when you are presenting your first fruits out of your labor, uh, out of your, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, from your garden, you never give the worst. You never give the worst lamb. You never give the worst grain. You never give the worst. You don't give the church the, the worst spotted. We don't want that. You ever try to give something to Salvation Army today? They don't even want it. Look at somebody say, give the best, give the best, give the best. And so Jesus, Paul is saying that God gave us his best as a down payment. Look at somebody say, I got a down payment. That heaven, heaven is my final destination. How do you know it? Because I got a down payment. Look at somebody say, yeah, I got a down payment. So you got to understand, Paul links first fruit to Jesus' resurrection. He links it to his resurrection, which the dedication of the first fruit guarantee and assure the blessings of God. That's relevant. That's important. Because Christ died. Listen, it assures and guarantees the blessing of God on my life. Y'all miss Y'all get that later. Y'all get that. Because he died. Because he rose. Because he ascended. And he seated at the right hand of the Father. It assures. It guarantees. That blessings. Are looking for me. Blessings. Are trying to find me. Blessings. Are all over my life. Look at somebody. And say the resurrection. It's for me. Resurrection, resurrection, resurrection. Yeah, that's me. Look at somebody say the resurrection is for. So every 
bear fruit that follows Christ are you a fruit of Christ every fruit that you take part of and if your life is fruitful I have a guarantee I am assured that heaven is my goal look at somebody say yes yes Lord I am on my way look at somebody say are you on your way to heaven I got to get out of here but Romans 8 and 11 says it this way but if the spirit come on come on y'all read it with me I got two minutes but if the spirit of him Come on, that raise, come on, up Jesus, come on, from, dwell in you. Now, what am I mean? If I got the same spirit that dwells in me, come on, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. trying to preach this thing I'm trying to get out of here but I want you to know if you believe that this is it for you you can have it but I'm on my way I'm on my way I'm on my way to heaven because God his spirit is going to quicken me quicken me so I can I will I got heaven as my goal. Y'all want to have no church with me. So we keep the resurrection proof relevant. When we take resurrection power personally. When we take it prophetically. And when we take it practically. Come on, say practically. In other words, this is what I'm trying to say. This is what I'm trying to say. It's useless and worthless to come in this house this morning if you don't believe in the resurrection. You could have stayed in the bed and had some eggs and did everything. Yeah, look at somebody and say it's useless. You could have saved your good makeup and your clothes. You smell good. Look at somebody and say it's useless and pointless unless I believe. I received what happened on this morning. Look at somebody say, I don't, I won't, I won't reject it. I accept it. He died. Didn't he die? You know he died. You know he died. But early, early, one Sunday morning, he got up with all power. gotta go it's pointless pointless to wear out your heels say it has to go off all girdle up and can on what are we here for if you don't receive that he got him up stay home I got Bible on it first Corinthians 15 and 30 says it this way why are we in danger every hour Paul Paul is asking them the first, he had to correct them, he had to correct them, he had to correct them. Because folk were trying to confuse them, folk were trying to create doubt. He said, why are you in danger every hour? In other words, if there was no resurrection, Paul is asking, why would he place his life in jeopardy? I want you to know, when folk find out you believe, you had a nerve to believe in the resurrection, they coming for you. Oh no, they gonna come for you. They gonna kinda, they gonna try to argue with you, you know. Uh, and I, I'm primarily setting up my, my young people because didn't nobody tell me this, sister Denise. Nobody, we told, they taught me how to dance. But they didn't tell me that when I got to the college campus, sister Erica, they was coming for me. Agnostics, atheists, they, they coming for you, they coming for you. So you got to be able to give an account. You got to be able to give a defense. 
as to why you believe in this from a practical standpoint. And so Paul said, why in the world would I be taking my life in jeopardy if I didn't believe in this? Why would a believer ever jeopardize himself, his life, his job, his position, his friends, his acceptance, if there is no resurrection? And so Paul lived his life out for the gospel's sake as evidence of truth of the resurrection. I'm standing in front of you as a attorney trying to tell you, yes, I have a degree. I think I got a few of them. I got some other folks that got some degrees in here. But I absolutely believe that he died. Come on, Sister Anthony, preach with me. That he died. I'm college educated, but he died. I got degrees on my wall, but he died. He was raised, but early was Sunday. Yes, he did. He got up yes, he did. with all, with all, all power. power. I gotta go. I'm gonna tell you this, and we gonna shout to victory. Come on, y'all, give me, y'all, give me together now. But verse 32, verse 32, Paul argues again. If there is no resurrection, then we ought to just eat, drink, and be merry. Enjoy life while you can. It's easy to see that the practical points make sense. But he, then he had to get them. So to these, verse 34, he said, shame on you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I've taught you better than that. How many of y'all got children, grandchildren, niece and nephew that get out somewhere and act as if you ain't never put nothing down on them and you look at them, you say, shame on you. And that's what Paul doing in his corrective letter to the Corinthian church. He said, you ought to know better. And if you had any doubt, you should have got with the saints. You should have got with them and say, how can I help you with that? Because along the way, you know, when you first get to college, it's all good. It's all good. You got your little place. It's all good. But along the way, only a few of y'all going to be able to testify with me. Along the way, when life hits you. Along the way, when you get a few disappointments, along the way, when things just don't work out, I need somebody to say, shame on you, shame on you for believing some foolishness because he died. I got resurrection, I got resurrection power. So be not conformed. Romans 12 and 2 says, be not conformed to this world. Don't think like the world. Don't talk like the world. Be not conformed to this world. But be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is good and be acceptable. Perfect. We'll live God. I got to go. But I want you to know the cross. Hit me one time. The cross. Hit me one time. The cross. It repels foolishness. The cross talk. When you have the nerve to talk about the cross, it repels corrupt company. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. So Paul said to them, he said to the Corinthian church, and I'm saying to you on this morning, wake up, check your company out, because it corrupts good morals. To my college students, watch your company wherever you go, because it corrupts good company. And John, wake up from your drunken stupor as it is right. So stop sinning. Look at somebody say they don't preach that no more. Stop sinning. For if some have no knowledge, you gotta get away from them. So they don't make a fool out of you. Look at somebody say, check your circle. Check your circle. Check your circle. Check your circle. Cause I believe God is always on my side. I believe God will never fail. I believe God is faithful. I believe 
God got purpose on my life. I believe that he loves me. I believe I got power all over my life. I believe I got joy. 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 from people that ain't believing them and you got to tell them God made it fail He made it fail <laughs> Everything the devil tried God made it fail Come on look at somebody God made it fail 